Good morning, well, afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Dara Hoffman. I am the program coordinator with the Master of Archives and Records Administration, as well as an assistant professor here in the School of Information. And I am delighted that uh, Mara is able to co-host this webinar with the CPGE Academic EDI Committee, and that we are able to have Dr. Aisha Johnson, who is an incredible archivist, librarian, and scholar, share her work and her experience with us today. Um, so it's my pleasure now to hand a hosting over to Dr. Villagran. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. I'm uh, Dr. Villagran, CPGE uh, EDI Academic Committee Chair, co-hosting this with Mara. So welcome everyone. We're really excited for this webinar. I'm just gonna do a brief introduction about uh, Dr. Aisha Johnson's talk today around diversity for representation. She will discuss her path to librarianship, archives, and the discovery of the Julius Rosenwald Library Fund. And I don't wanna take any much more much time of, of her time. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Johnson, to kick us off. Hello, hello everyone. Let me know you can hear me and see me. I am Dr. Aisha Johnson, as mentioned. I hope all is well and you are having happy holidays. So during this discussion, if you will, not a lecture, please feel free to uh, put anything in the chat. Uh, I'll ask any questions along the way. I'm absolutely okay with that. Uh, if you have questions and you don't want to, you know, feel like you're interrupting, you can also wait till the end. We'll save a, a good uh, 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the end. So um, I see former students already. That's awesome. So hello, hello. We're going to talk about diversity for representation uh, in this beautiful profession. I love librarianship. If you don't know anything else about me, you have to know that I love all things archives, museums, uh, and libraries. And you don't have to pick a side. So no, don't let anyone tell you that you do. You can love it all. Uh, but I love this profession, and it's something that I like to call a warm blanket right? Uh, there is not a single profession that does not need information literacy. So library and information science is that warm blanket. You put us over any profession and we make things that much better, right? So welcome to all the lovers of libraries, archives, and museums. But because we have such an important role in society, that being information uh, access and information literacy, you have to know and understand the importance of representation within such a profession that impacts our society and all of our communities, right? So this is why often we are talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, belonging, because libraries are indeed for everyone. So this is why we talk about diversity for representation. Diversity is so far beyond race, right? Of course, that's just what the eyes can see. But we're also talking about education, background, experiences, perspectives. All of those things make us different and more representative of the communities in which we serve. So my journey to librarianship is going to have to start as a, as a, as a child, like most of us, where, you know, my parents would take me to the library and enjoy. And I had a library at home, right? And then, of course, Growing up, I wanted to, of course, I say of course, like this is so natural. Of course, growing up, I wanted to be librarian of Congress. And seeing, doing my research and seeing that I would never be a white man, I knew I could never be librarian of Congress. And that hurt me so bad. I was just torn that day. My parents talk about it still, but I didn't see anything that looked like me. And because I didn't see anything that looked like me, I immediately denied my own self that dream. So the goal in which we operate and to do things is to counteract that. So no one actually experiences such things. Obviously our wonderful Dr. Carla Hayden has turned that around for many, many people to which I've shared this story with her when I met her. Um, she's turned that around for many, many people, but think about the impact of the lack of representation does to the psyche, does to uh, your ability to even phantom what you can do. As people of color and as uh, members of marginalized communities, 
We have to see it. To know that it is absolutely possible, we have to be able to touch it, right? Uh, so for me, that is where my journey to librarianship has led me uh, throughout my master's program. I've always focused on diversity within the field or the lack thereof. Uh, and that, of course, bled into uh, my platform for all things diversity, equity, inclusion, and African, or specifically African-American history and the development of Southern Public Library. So that's where we are now. Well, during my master's, my, excuse me, during my doctorate program, um, I took on a fellowship uh, funded by the IMLS uh, for increasing African-American diversity in archives. I became a uh, trained archivist during my doctorate program um, doing research because I wanted to do my research in the archives. So naturally, I wanted to understand archives and end up loving that as well and became a trained archivist while also being a formally educated librarian. Uh, so I took on this, uh, this fellowship and I was hosted by Fisk University who has the one of the most beautiful and legendary archives um, in, in this country. Uh, I mean, it's almost like a who's who of American education and African-American history and uh, just a beautiful collection of historical rare and unique materials. And I was assigned this collection I was assigned this collection uh, that had been sitting there for quite some time, and it turned out to be the Julius Rosenwald Fund uh, Library program. So it's the S.L. Smith collection standing for Samuel Leonard Smith, uh, personal papers and professional papers. And the collection is where I found the information that had been hidden like so many valuable and impactful stories in our archives. And I talked to my committee and I'm like, have you guys heard of this program? And, and if you have people in the South, if your grandparents, great grandparents were reared in the South and they went to school in the South, nine times out of 10, they went to a Rosenwald school. Now, Rosenwald, uh, the Julius Rosenwald Fund built a little bit over 5,300 schools in 15 Southern states. This was the primary way that African-Americans were uh, educated during that time period. Of course, you had other, uh, other, other initiatives like gene supervisors, of course, the AMA, American Missionary Association. But when we're talking about impact and the spread of African-American literacy, we have to know about the Julius Rosenwald Fund's uh, rural school program, right? Well, out of this program, one of the Southern directors, S.L. Smith, says to Julius Rosenwald, these schools are great. However, they don't have libraries. They don't have literature. They don't have access to additional literature, you know, as though they were reading already what they had. And that is what sparked the Julius Rosenwald Fund Library Program. Well, when I asked my, my committee members about it, and I mean, this was... 10 years ago. Uh, so, you know, nothing came up. It was absolutely nothing published on the Julius Rosenwald Fund uh, library program. While you could find a number of publications and some books on uh, the, the school program. So, you know, I took on the wonderful, late, great Toni Morris's advice of if there's a book you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. So I did. I wanted to know more. I wanted to learn as much as I could about this story and about this program and what it did for uh, not only African-American literacy, but the South, the intellectual development of the South. So library philanthropy was indeed the primary way for the development of Southern libraries. You know, uh, the South had this, this, this uh, unlawful marriage with segregation and, and discrimination to the point where big businesses didn't even wanna come South because they didn't want the moral, the moral discriminatory practices or they didn't wanna be associated with such uh, practices uh, because it just wasn't good for business. But the South was married to this custom, to this way of life. So the development of Negro institutions 
happen in the community, charitable organizations and philanthropists, right? A lot of grassroots movements was happening for the actual development. Why is that beyond economical? There is this misconception that if any institution um, for African-Americans, for Negroes was to develop, it had to significantly lag behind that of white Americans. Like that was the business plan. That was the strategy. You know, and if you think about the time period, African-Americans barely had access to education, let alone libraries, but even rural whites didn't have this access. So for that to be the mindset in the business plan, it was not only detrimental to African-Americans, it was detrimental to the entire American South. But that's not what people saw. They wanted to keep and prevent this one particular culture from rising. And that's something that we have to recognize even today, how African-Americans break through and open the door or break a glass ceiling for other cultures. It's a benefit of all, right? BIPOC marginalized communities and members of these groups, we help each other, right? Uh, but by targeting, they really hurt the economy and the society, right? Uh, of the entire American South, because the more educated a society you have, the better economy you have as well. So the Julius Rosenwald Fund focuses on four different areas education, which also is going to uh, include library services, health and medical services, fellowships and scholarships, and of course, race relations, which we refer to as social studies today. The fund is going to operate between 1917 and 1948. Now, of course, we know of two main key contributors. I know everyone has heard of uh, Andrew Carnegie, but rarely have heard of Julius Rosenwald. And we'll talk about why that is. Now, if we want to think about Carnegie develops about 2000 libraries nationally and a few international um, throughout his time, you know, uh, well, throughout his, I would say his focus on uh, library development. The problem or issue there is with uh, Carnegie's model, money was given to the African American, um, the African American uh, library, the African American community, and then money was given to the white community. Where's that issue? The issue is it was usually about 10% for the colored library uh, versus what was given to the uh, white community. So for example, classic example, Carnegie gives $100,000 in 1901 to, uh, for a white library in Atlanta. Well, he gives $10,000 to the Black community for a Black or colored library. One, that's a, the, the, that's a problem with the funding, right? Well, it takes the Black community 20 years to open that library. 20 years because of such a discriminatory practice, right? And nobody batted an eye at the difference in the funding because that was the custom, right? But think about that. 20 years to open a simple library for the Black community. That's problematic in itself, and it sends the wrong message uh, or really continues to fuel the wrong message, right, of value um, in people over other humans. So with the Julius Rosenwald Fund Library Program, the goal is to improve literacy and enhance educational opportunities, specifically for African Americans. We have to understand the value and impact that literacy has on society, that literacy and access has have on communities. So 1927 to 1941, we're going to see a distribution of about 9,400 libraries. Now, when we talk about libraries throughout this discussion, Libraries will also include library sets or book sets. So we really actually get up to about 10,000, right? And we'll discuss that. Now, there's 43 Black colleges and normal schools, better known today as HBCUs, historically Black colleges and universities, uh, that actually benefit. We'll talk about the significance of that. And in 29 to 36, there's a, a, a library county demonstration that changes 
what we now consider county or public libraries. It changes the entire landscape for us. So with the rural schools, of course, there's going to be, uh, remember we have 15 participating Southern states. So each of those uh, libraries are going to get 10, uh, excuse me, library sets with up to 150 titles. There's 10 libraries that are actually going to participate in each of those 15 states, right? Um, when we talk about up to 150 titles, it depends on the, the school and the class size. Remember, you know, the multi-generational in one classroom model comes from this. So African-Americans would be in one, two, three room schoolhouses, but initially one room schoolhouses, and there was multiple generations in these schools. It's so funny how history is cyclical because now we have three, four generations in a classroom, right? So, but the problem is here, uh, they're going to school around harvest. How we go to school now is, is not how obviously they went to school, right? Um, they went to school around harvest. So those books were a variety of topics from African-American contributions to uh, different subject matters that would build knowledge, um, you know, and educating the principal and the teachers about the library, about the value of the library, about the impact of the library, but about the reading material itself. So we do reader advisory services today. You know, the, the traditional reference interview, the, the officials were teaching the principals and the teachers about the things we talk about, about the things we teach in our high schools, right? Our schools of library and information science. Um, of course, it was free access and use of the books. And why was this so important? Because these libraries were oftentimes the first level of exposure that community members even had. To this day, most of the time people are initially exposed to libraries is in the school library, which is why the school library is so important. You know, it is that introduction. I still remember my school librarian, Mrs. Brown, and the impact that she had as a Black librarian uh, in my magnet school. So this was significant because not only are we focused on the education of the students in the community, but we're focused on the education of the people at home. There was this, this, this notion that Black children could not read or did not read because their parents could not read or did not read, and that wasn't the case. Uh, when they sent these books home with the students, it was recorded uh, statistically that the book would be read by at least five people before it was returned to the library. So now we're being able to def defunct these notions uh, or these misconceptions and really understand that it wasn't a lack of desire. It was just there was no, no food to feed the desire. There was no access to, to successfully fulfill the need or the desire for books, for reading, for literacy. Right. Uh, we have to understand that it wasn't that black children could not read or did not read because their parents could not read or did not read. It was simply because they did not have the supply. So now we're focused on collection development or as they note in the documents and the historical documents, a consistent addition of new books. That's collection development. You're going to see a lot of the traditional librarian themes and library information science uh, foundational you know, pieces and principles in this program. And a lot of them are coming out of understanding the very core of what we do, information needs of people. Um, again, it served the, uh, the community residents as well. And the beautiful thing about this entire, this entire program um, in the Fisk University archives is that there's annual reports from administrators, from the teachers, how, you know, uh, of course, statistical, but also qualitative and how eager and grateful and excited the students were to, you know, tell visitors about the books they're reading and the new stories and answer the questions, uh, you know, that the visitors may have because officials from the fund also uh, visited the different schools to really see how the programs was going, to see how it was building out. So we're also going to have reading encouragement is what I call it. Reading encouragement is when you are 
providing access, when you are uh, constantly developing the collection, when you are engaging the students with the books, it's a feed, it's a pool, um, you know, so we want to see that, especially in our youth. When you teach children how to read young, you're going to create uh, readers and lifelong learners. Now, the African-American colleges and libraries, um, and, and be very clear, I'm using the titles found in the documents, but yes, we do refer to the African-American colleges, normal schools today as historically black colleges and universities if they qualify for that, resi that federal designation. So the thing you need to understand about the Julius Rosenwald Fund Program is that it all started with experiments. Uh, Rosenwald is a very wise businessman, an extremely wise businessman who really likes to test the waters before he dives in. He really enjoys testing the waters before he dives in. And testing the waters for him is going to look like a year, uh, a year experiment with X amount of dollars focused on particular institutions and seeing how that plays itself out. And if it's successful, then expand it. And I guess it just so happened to be very lucky and business oriented, you know, business savvy for him that these experiments worked using this model, you know, and, and it wasn't just, okay, I'm gonna throw this money out there and let's see what happens. No, it was a business plan for philanthropy. There was a business plan for these organizations to succeed. One, no organization, whether it was the rural schools, the high schools, the black colleges, the county libraries, no one was just given money. No one. There was a match and it depends on what level. It could have been uh, $1 to $1 or $1 up to $4, depending on the size of the organization in which he was helping or the division in which these libraries fell under. And so what you have there is a buy-in. Now, what I want you to really understand is these were rural black communities. They barely had anything. So for them as a community to come up with this money and help build the buildings, survey and maintain the land, that's desire. That's how much they wanted this, right? So when the African-American colleges uh, division comes along, we're gonna do uh, five experimental colleges. Of course, um, what is now known as Tennessee State, Southern University, Tuskegee University, Virginia State College, and Winston-Salem uh, State University. Those were the initials. See, the problem is you had African-American schools African-American colleges that were often teacher training colleges and didn't have children's literature. How? How do I sufficiently teach someone to become uh, a, a teacher without the literature, without training material? How do I do that sufficiently and then expect them to be able to get a teacher job. Pretty difficult, right? But you also have to understand the impact of accreditation. You also have to understand the impact that libraries have on accreditation still to this day, especially during this time period, uh, libraries can make or break accreditation. And many of these colleges, and we'll talk about the high schools, but many of these colleges lacked accreditation because they didn't have adequate libraries. And let's be clear, while accreditation standards and things of that nature may change over time, a library is required. So these institutions, what I call a disadvantage by financial design, because academia is a business. It's a feel-good business, and we love what we do, but academia is a business, right? So these institutions, some of them were really legit set up to fail. So, but we're going to see a complete turnaround with the African-American colleges, right? This division is deemed the most successful because not only does it build library facilities, 
They are going to give them a collection like we've never seen in libraries. We're talking about hundreds of books covering a variety of subjects. But perhaps most importantly, depending on how you feel, it's kind of a chicken or the egg debate. Um, you know, does a library come first or does the, the librarian? At this time, we're going to get Hampton Institute which also comes out of this program between the Julius Rosenwald program, the ALA and others build out Hampton Institute's library school, which is the first at an HBCU. So we're gonna take teachers from these institutions, exemplary teachers, we're gonna take them from these institutions and send them to Hampton for a year of study. They're coming back as librarians. This is why I always tell people, we get a lot of people who find this profession as a second or third uh, career. And they're like, well, I was a teacher before, so I got to unlearn all of that. And I'm like, no, you don't. No, 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 no. Bring all of that in your tool belt. Bring all of it. Those are vital skills to what we do. So we're gonna see a reading encouragement. We're gonna see massive amounts of books that we've not seen before. We're gonna see children's literature libraries for teacher training colleges. And you know, this, this division was probably, it's definitely was, was deemed the most successful, but it probably was also one of the hardest divisions for me to write about because the uh, Curtis Florence, Florence Curtis, would send the list to a professor in Chicago um, and say, hey, this is the book list that I want to put in the, the Black schools, the Black colleges down here. This is the book list. And literally in black and white, it says, there's no way the Southern Negro is reading on a college level. This is for a college. It's for a college. And they're saying, no way is a Southern Negro reading at the college level. Perhaps you need to dumb this down to elementary or grade school, as it was called. So as a Black woman in academia who happens to be a librarian and an archivist, that is quite disgusting. It is quite heartbreaking to see with no shame the discriminatory thinking of college level students simply because of their race and the geographic location. Now the high schools are really significant as well. Now we're gonna see that large uh, quality and quantity uh, of beautiful uh, subjects and all the literature, right? No problem. This is great. We're on the same path. But don't you know, library is places where this comes from. Library is place focuses on not only the facility, but what the library brings. So we are literally going to see an outline of what a library should look like, feel like from the furniture to the carpet to the, the location of where the books are, even to the lighting the temperature, the library facility guidelines are studied because Smith and colleagues had a background that focused on buildings and facilities. The other beautiful thing about this is a lot of these Negro or African-American high schools were not accredited because again, they didn't have the libraries that they needed, right? Well, the level in which the, the library upgraded the school, they were actually able to get accreditation. Now, if you don't work in academia, let me tell you why accreditation is so important. If I'm in high school and I'm coming from an accredited high school, an unaccredited high school, how do I get into an accredited college? Or if I'm graduating from an unaccredited college, how do I get a job? Because what accreditation says is that you know at least the minimum of this field, those policies, those guidelines, that theory that you need to understand and conduct the practice, right? See, education gives you the ideal. Education gives you the theory. Education, accredited education says this person is at minimum ready to enter the practice. They have a grip on the theory 
of what it is they're supposed to be doing. Without that accreditation, your personal accreditation isn't there. So the fact that these institutions lacked accreditation was the economical problem for African-Americans being able to come up, do better, change things for their family and potentially generations to come. Again, a design by financial disadvantage. Now, the library demonstration is so wonderful. It's so beautiful. The Julius Rosenwald Fund puts $500,000. This is 1929. Please understand the money that was put towards this program would translates into the millions today. Okay? Julius Rosenwald, businessman, former uh, CEO of, of Sears and Roebuck, really put his money towards African-American literacy because he wanted to better mankind. He understood what literacy and education could do for society, right? So the beautiful thing about this county library demonstration is unlike the other divisions, he didn't have to do this one alone. See, he wanted to do the uh, libraries and build on them for HBCUs and African-American colleges, but nobody wanted to help him. He proceeded on because he understood the need and more so the impact of what that could do for African-Americans. Now, here in the county, he puts half a million dollars up and then Carnegie comes in and extends this five year program to two years with more money. So that's wonderful. Right. So we have some support happening here. But the county library demonstration is really want to focus on service and a different level of service for that time period, but more so very modern, right? What we're doing today. So this is innovation in 1929. Now, I want you to pay attention to the states. Now, I want you to pay attention to the counties. See, in order for these, these uh, counties to qualify, one, there had to be state legislation for uh, library services per capita. Um, and they also had to support, be able to match. Because remember, Rosenwald doesn't want to do anything long-term on his own. What he's doing is trying to set up the community to be able to sustain beyond his philanthropy, right? Just an initiative, a Kickstarter, if you will. Now, the per capita, you had to have at least, the goal was to get it to 50 cents per capita. There were states that had as low, like Florida, had as low as two cents per capita for library services. Who's that helping? Who's that, like they, the states had to agree. Now we're going beyond local. The state itself had to agree the state had to agree to raise the per capita in order to participate in this program. The goal was 50 cents. Now, if you notice these Southern states are some of the bloodiest states that we have read about during the civil rights movement, 54 to 64, right? Excuse me, 54 to 68. Some of the bloodiest states. Let me tell you what is so significant about this county library demonstration. There was those financial stipulations, but there's this one particular stipulation that changes the game, honestly. It is the stipulation that no matter who it is, if it is a county resident, black, white, urban, or rural, they were required to be granted access. So it was this program that actually caused people to desegregate for books, for access, for literacy. For seven years. What happened between those time periods? We don't know. And it's not to say that this program was perfect because even in the statistics, they had to really uh, rectify some discriminatory practices by some of the library workers and, and librarians because a trained librarian was required in order for them to also participate. 
And there was some circulatory uh, discrimination, discriminatory practices and collection development, uh, though you can naturally see that African-Americans in some of these counties were checking out more books than others. But that's why these reports were so important, because, you know, the fund wanted to make sure its intention was actually happening. But that significant, that, that stipulation was so significant because never before had this happened. Remember, I mentioned that Carnegie would give money to the white community for a library and then separately, maybe 10% um, to the colored community for a black library. The it was segregation. He honored that, right? But Rosenwald, the Rosenwald Fund defied it. And they said, there's no need for us to put two libraries in one county where we can funnel all that money and all those resources into one county library for everyone. So you actually statistically had African-Americans and white people, and we're talking the South, so we have to recognize, you know, uh, Hispanics and also Native Americans in the Everyone in the county had to have access, had to utilize, and accountability was there in the reporting. So the county demonstration is focused on rendering services. We're talking about education, recreational, and cultural, the things that a library as place still operates as today. We're going to see pay collections and regular circulation of books and a variety of special programming public programming. We're gonna see provisions uh, for adult education programs um, and all types of arts and music programs as well. Even some traveling exhibits. And again, this is all documented within the quarterly reports. Now, just because we have uh, Libraries, practices of Rosenwald libraries, meaning Rosenwald funded libraries, we recognize those practices, right? Um, but those libraries were also set up to influence those who could not qualify in positive ways. It was a demonstration of what was possible and how libraries really benefited the community and society as a whole. So we're gonna see cooperative efforts in increasing the amount of materials available and accessible collection development and cooperation and professional training for teachers and librarians and a cooperative study of those regional problems. And that's gonna be deemed race relations, social studies and class impact problems. So what about others, right? Well, whenever you do research, you have to stay open to whatever the archives, whatever the books are going to offer you. Yes, you have your inquiry. Yes, you have your research set, your questions, all of that good jazz that we teach you. But if you stay open, the materials will offer you way more than you bargain for. So that's what I do as a scholar. I stay open. And going in there, focus, but also eyes wide open, the materials bless me with a number of what I call emergent codes. Um, so we were able to actually code, we meaning myself and the researcher, me, <laughs> was actually able to code these areas that I was not focused on and the impact in which the Julius Rosenwald Fund had on state library commissions, library schools, scholarships and fellowships, training institutes and meetings, because again, before Hampton, there was no African. Now, we do have to recognize, of course, Thomas, Thomas Fountain Blue, right? Um, in his training program at Louisville. But formally, degree wise or uh, certification wise, Hampton didn't come about until 1925. Extended library services to predominantly uh, heavy populated African American cities and libraries for military services. Between 1927 and 1947, the fund spent nearly $900,000 on library service. That translates into the millions today, tens of millions today. Okay. 
Now, let's talk about the need for Black librarianship, diversity for representation. Of course, you know, um, Michelle Dare and I recently attended Elise and Elise, uh, the Association for Library and Information Science Educators in Pittsburgh last month. And uh, one of the presenters was talking about the breakdown. Well, we know significantly that the profession itself is about 90% white, right? And it's a joke at this point, right? And, and the profession jokes about a stereotypical librarian. Um, it's an unfortunate truth. 5% African-American and everyone else, all other cultures and race less, some even less than 1%. Well, let's look at the academic side of that. 4% African-American PhDs, four, in this wonderful, beautiful profession. So we talk about the need for Black librarianship. We also have to recognize the need for uh, Blacks, Hispanics, Latino, Native Americans, Asian. We have to recognize the need for everyone because it impacts service, practice, profession, curriculum. It impacts everything. We need to be able to have adequate representation because library anxiety exists, discriminatory practices exist, uh, bias exists, unconscious bias exists, right? I always tell my students at the very beginning of the semester in my foundations class, if you're not here to service everyone, this is not the profession for you. So my job as a Black librarian, a Black woman librarian, is not only to advocate for people who look like me, but everyone who also doesn't look like me. The unheard, the unseen, the undervalued, right? That's underrepresentation. So access to information, of course, provides an undeniable impact to DEI, right? Because there's different perspectives. People learn differently. We have to understand those information seeking behaviors, right? Alfreda Chapman talks about life in the round, one of my favorite theories that I love to use. Well, people will seek information from those they're comfortable with first or those who look like them, similar environments. But if I walk into a library and everyone looks like me, do you understand how vulnerable it is to admit you don't know something to someone who does not look like you? Our society does that every day. And by us not being representative of, as a profession, we actually hurt the people we're trying to help. So, of course, Rosenwald Fund played a key role in advocating, supporting, and funding the formalization of Black librarianship. I have a question in the chat. Can you speak further on how Hispanic Americans are included in this conversation? I'm a female Mexican American entering the MLIS special sessions program and look forward to increasing the number of Hispanic working uh, in librarianship. Yes. So Hispanic Americans are included in this conversation because let's break down America's class system. A lot of people uh, will perceive uh, discrimination rooted in race and gender. Discrimination, you have to take a step back. Discrimination is rooted in class. America's built on a class system. So we have a, 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 an issue with wanting to have classes of people, right? And while I don't believe people belong in categories, this is how we fuel systematic discrimination. So again, when I'm advocating as a black woman, I'm not just advocating for black people. It is my job to advocate for Hispanic Americans. You're in this profession, you're also less than 5%. So the conversation is focused on whomever your platform is, but you got to understand the impact on access and literacy for BIPOC and marginalized communities. We all play a role. Even the profession that is majority white, we all play a role in this. So if I'm in a Hispanic serving community or I work at a Hispanic, predominantly Hispanic serving institution, meaning college, right? Those students still need to see someone who looks like them. So the very fact that you are a minority entering this field 
and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Adina, it's going to change lives. It's representation where my Librarian of Congress story where I couldn't be, I, I'm not ever gonna be a white man. I can't be Librarian of Congress. There's no way I should have had that thought. But immediately that was my thought. I can't be what I wanted to be because I'm not that. Representation matters beyond uh, what we just see on the surface, if that makes sense. Let me know if I answered your question. Geneva says as, absolutely. Geneva says as for seeking more archives, hands-on experience, how would you advise a new MLIS graduate student to do so? Are there any HBCU pipelines for postgraduate students? Um, I find most new entry level archives jobs require one or two years. Good question. Um, while I do recommend internships, there's very few of us who could work for free, right? Let's just be real. Um, and another thing that I've asked the you know, profession to do, even in my position, when we have these entry level positions, um, librarian one, librarian archivist one, and it requires two years of experience, well, that's not an entry level position. And it's actually unfair to you know, those who are entering the profession. So I always ask people, because it's a matter of, do you want to train? Are you willing to train? And when you see that one to two years of experience or three years of experience, it gives the message that one, maybe they're not good enough, or two, the institution doesn't want to take the time and do the work and training. Now, I can speak for me. Whereas associate dean in Acad for academic affairs and outreach at Georgia Tech Library, you know, I have librarian one, uh, you know, or hiring for uh, that entry level, and we required that two years of experience. I said, hey, we need to remove this. It sends the wrong message. So now we're talking about people. You know, I, I'm pretty, I do relentless advocacy, right? But I'm legit sticking my neck out on the line when you call out institutional uh, behaviors that counteract practices, right? I would encourage advocacy from people who are in positions to change policy. Now, I will also encourage you all, new graduates, mid-career professionals, to seek leadership and management training so you can be at the table where change in policy happens. So um, HBCU pipelines postgraduate, you know, there's only one um, HBCU with the Library of Information Science program, unfortunately, but fortunately, they are still um, strong, and that's North Carolina Central University. So I would, if you can, I will look at fellowships, I will look at residencies that do indeed pay, but while you're in school, I know I mean, I worked full time while going through my master's program, and I also did a part time um, internship in the evening in archives and, and reference um, area. Um, but a lot of us cannot work for free. Right. So that that will that can indeed be a hiccup. Uh, but I, I am constantly advocating for entry level positions to truly be entry. So um, I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. Vishnu, excuse me if I did, how is class defined and how is it different from category? So class is going to really focus on the have and have nots. Think about the digital divide. The digital divide is not only a geographical issue like we sometimes paint it, it's also a class issue because there are certain classes of people that have never experienced a digital divide. And category is usually going to be based on some type of common factor within, um, but class is going to be based on access, opportunity, privilege, and it will gauge up and down that range depending on where society has decided you uh, or your uh, culture should be, if you will. Thank you for sharing that, Michelle. I appreciate it. Thank you for the questions. So let's talk about standardizing black librarianship. So one of the conditions of course made by the fund when granting aid was it had, the libraries had to have a trained librarian. And of course there was, there was a library school in the South. 
The Carnegie Library School of Atlanta, established in 19, uh, 1905. Uh, Bashan, race is a part of the class system. Discriminatory, no problem. Right. Race is a part of the class system. Um, so there was a school, the Carnegie Library School of Atlanta in 1905 to 1925. And in 25, it eventually merges with Emory. But that school was only training white librarians. It was only training white librarians. And in the South, you know, we have census records to show, you know, a couple hundred library workers of color. But they couldn't get training. So Julius Rosenwald Fund and the ALA, they have this what I call chicken or the egg debate that I mentioned earlier. And it's really was the question if the library or the librarian should come first. And out of that conversation came the production of Hampton Institute's library school. Now, there's other library schools, of course, that come about. Um, of course, we have Atlanta, Atlanta University, now known as Clark Atlanta, North Carolina Central, Alabama, DC, a number of HBCUs that have library science programs. Unfortunately, like I've mentioned, there's only North Carolina Central now standing strong um, and, and focused on educating a variety of librarians, right? Um, but the library schools, the fund required the county libraries to have that trained librarian. And there was a deficiency in the number of what we call trained librarians because they couldn't go to these institutions, not because they didn't want to, but because they weren't allowed. Now the fund made financial contributions to Hampton Institute, Emory University, as well as um, uh, Atlanta University and a number of training uh, programs. So, but there was also scholarships and fellowships to entice promising black men and women to take on uh, the work in the library field. Now, the beautiful thing is more than um, 30, 35 scholarships were funded for these promising men and women in library administration. So early on, we're also going to understand the impact of library administrators of color, the representation that is needed. I've had this conversation before where people of color need to have support built in to any employer. They need to. And administrators of color make a significant difference in representation. There's a different perspective, right? There's a different experience. There's a different level of understanding. So when the fund is doing something completely separate from the library program and funding uh, scholarships and learning opportunities focused on library administration, you got to see the bigger picture. Vivian Harsh, who's one of my librarian sheroes, you know, Black librarian in Chicago, branch named after her, an amazing, beautiful collection. She was a recipient. She was a recipient of this scholarship, one of 35. We have to do more digging, and this, this information is all available in the Fisk University archives, but we want to do, you know, uh, some, uh, some more digging on seeing where are they now as well, so we can really understand the large impact that happened. I mentioned that the fund also funded, you know, of course, Atlanta University, but the institutes, summer institutes, training institutes for the Southeastern Library Association, as well as uh, two uh, conference for Negro librarians held at Fisk University. There was also funding provided for the National Institute for Library Field Agents in Wisconsin. It was a constant feeding, even though Hampton had been established in 1925, we still need to fuel, funnel that education in the South, okay? So what's next? Of course, we continue advocacy and research. We, we use the platform and voice our advocacy, but we also use research and scholarship to put the advocacy to paper, right? Advocacy is not just about lip service, but it's about action, right? So we look at diversity for representation, and that's about serving the underserved, looking at the diversity statement and actions of academic, public, college, 
school libraries, understanding um, the history which BCALA, the Black Caucus of American Library Association, Reforma, there's so many associations, right? There's representation. Uh, and those associations exist because of the lack of representation at one point. Extremely important, and I encourage you to join the um, organization that you identify best with. Um, hiring practices. We have to review hiring practices such as that one or two years for entry level position. Like how open are we really being? Because it sends the message that we're really not open and we're not willing uh, to really train people as much as we say we are. But we also have to call the profession to action because that's where uh, our biggest impact can happen is when the profession also, and we're very well supported, but the profession uh, does more professional organizations, does more about, uh, you know, such discriminatory practices, you know, um, and of course, discussion and writings on contributions of others within the field, outside the field. And I mean, not only us scholars, or as academics, right? If you're a practitioner, you can be a scholar. I'm a strong believer in what the model I call scholar practitioner. You're doing the work. What you're doing can inform the practice. It can inform the profession. It can inform the curriculum. Be a scholar practitioner, get involved, publish, write. I don't care if it's starting a blog about various experiences, get involved. Be a scholar in the profession because it makes a significant difference and it also helps us produce practical professionals. It's diversity for representation because our society is diverse. Thank you all. I appreciate you. You can ask any questions or pick up the microphone. I know I kind of went to the line, but we had some questions in between there. So anyone have any questions? That was wonderful, Dr. Johnson. I don't have any questions. I'm just checking the chat. And I know um, Dr. Hoffman's checking the chat too. Oh, thank um, you. I just want to mention um, briefly about um, upcoming webinars. So the college, uh, CPGE, our academic EDI committee, we've already confirmed um, one webinar in the spring so far on indigenous data sovereignty. And then we have a second one we're hopefully going to have confirmed on feminist privacy. So stay tuned for those two college ones. Uh, and I'll put links in the chat to all of our upcoming webinars at the college and the iSchool um, webcast page. And Dr. Hoffman, I'll turn it over to you to close. I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. This was so, it was it was moving and really just reaffirming of the work we all do in this field. And I, I know I feel inspired and recommitted to, you know, my piece of the work as a white person to make sure that my students uh, are all feel included and are going out and making this this warm blanket something that covers and embraces everyone. So we are so privileged to have had you today and I'm so Thank grateful you. for you sharing your time and expertise with us all. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Listen, do the work, you guys. Just remember, we're here to service everyone, those who look like us and most importantly, those who also don't. All right. Thank you all so much. I appreciate you.